Stop climate change, stop climate change, let's make it go away. Stop climate change, stop climate change, let's save the earth today. I am the Kaiju no Kami, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the 1994 premiere run of what is commonly known as Heisei Ultra 7. To commemorate Ultra 7's 25th-ish anniversary, Tsuburaya decided to release two television specials in 1994 that was set after the original Ultra 7 series, ignoring everything that followed up between Return through 80. Although, this does kind of solidify my personal belief that the Earth in Ultra 7 was set in an alternate universe compared to the follow-up series. Either way, these two episodes are set nearly two decades after Seven's original ending. It is also worth noting that Tsuburaya would continue to produce follow-up specials in 98, 99, and 2002. However, I'm just going to focus on the two made in 1994. Is the return to the world of Ultra 7 a grandiose celebration? Or should these have never made it past the paper they were written on? Let's find out. The Heroes. Being a continuation of Ultra 7, the episodes follow the exploits of the Ultra Guard, who are still protecting the Earth decades later. Furuhashi and Anne are the only characters to return from the original series, though Anne is no longer a member of the Ultra Guard. Instead, she is a mother of a boy she named Dan in honor of Seven, and that's all we know about her. Being Anne's son, Dan has the biggest character shields of all as an alien is ordered to kill him, but she is unable to bring herself to do so, and instead captures Dan because of course she does. As for Furuhashi, he is now captain of Ultra Guard and seems to run a tight ship. The three main cohorts under his command include Kaiji, Pogo, and Lisa. Most of you will recognize Kaiji's actor, Kagamaru Shigeki, for he played Shinjo in Ultraman Tiga. Takahashi Matsuyuma plays Togo, who was featured in both Juon and Kamen Rider Kuga, among voicing several anime characters. <laughs> As for Lisa, she is portrayed by Amy Suzuki, who would go on to play Kotoko Fujioka in the live action adaptation of Oran Host Club. <laughs> I wish I could say something detailed about this trio, but alas, I cannot, as they are nothing more than Aaron boys. And girl, obviously. They're just there to be the field soldiers to trick the audience into thinking there's an actual plot to these pair of episodes. I've seen worse. You ever been to Detroit? You are probably asking yourself, hey wait, this show is called Ultra 7, so why aren't you talking about Dan here? Well, that's simple. Dan hardly holds a presence at all in either of these episodes. In fact, Dan doesn't even actually appear in the first one, only his voice does for a brief few moments. Seven is unconscious for the first 40 minutes of the premiere story. <laughs> Thankfully, he does physically show up on screen as Dan in the second tale, even if it is only for a fraction of the time. He just wanders around wearing the outfit he wore in the very first episode of the original series back in 67, as he tracks down what the aliens of the story are up to. Dan and Furuhashi never even actually meet up. It's like the show is too afraid to go through with the reunion it is advertising. The Aliens and Monsters. Two episodes, so two sets of aliens and monsters to discuss. The first episode brings back Alien Pit, who continues to take on the form of two twin girls, along with their pet, Ella King. <laughs> this time around, they have come to Earth to destroy it via global warming because we are taking too long to do it ourselves, and they are very impatient beings. <laughs> Kaiju 
地球を限りなく温暖化しようとしていた A couple of Metrons are the villains for the second episode who come to Earth to destroy the ozone and cause global warming since we are taking too long to do it ourselves and they are also very impatient beings. I'm beginning to sense a pattern here. At least they're not trying to protect the environment with car power. The Matron also use a dinosaur in their plot, so that was cool, I guess. A huge Tyrannosaurus ate our lawyer. There is an oddity that I do want to mention that occurs in the first episode. Furuhashi walks into a meeting where a general is talking about monsters who have attacked the world in the past, all of which are those that appeared in the original Ultraman series, as opposed to Ultra 7. How does that make any sense? And why would you do that? Oh, I guess they're all monsters related to global warming or something. What? The effects and music. I gotta wonder what the thought process was at the board meeting for this thing. Did someone say, hey, what type of effects and music should we put into the show? And then someone responded with, yes. Because that's what it feels like. Oh, yeah. First off, the music used is just carry over from the original series, which on one aspect sounds like a cool idea until you realize how lazy the execution is. Sometimes it sounds like they just randomly threw the tracks into the scene without a care as to whether they fit or not. For example, this track sounds completely out of place with what is happening during the battle between Seven and Elekine. <laughs> The opening song from the original series is used for both the opening and closing song to this show. I understand wanting to honor the old show, but couldn't you have made at least one of these two brand new? They should have done a new opening song and saved the old one for the ending theme. As for the effects... <laughs> They're fine, I guess. The miniatures look quite fake as if they were slapped together as fast as possible, green screen effects come off cheap looking, and the fights aren't all that impressive either. Even the camera work is quite lackluster compared to the intriguing angles and techniques used in the past. During the battle between Seven and the Metron, they recreate the freeze frame shot, but it doesn't look anywhere near as impressive because in the original show, you had that sunset background to enhance the atmosphere. Oh look! A call back to the original show. Yay! It's like the people in charge of this iteration were trying to show audiences how badly the effects work of the 90s regressed from those in the 60s. Come on guys, we already had Toho doing that in the 90s with Godzilla. We didn't need you doing it with Ultra 7 as well. The episodes. Obviously there's only two episodes to talk about, but what is our message from these two episodes? <laughs> That's right. Humanity sucks. My freaking god. How many times in these episodes do they need to remind us that we are destroying the environment? If you want to see Ultraman take the social commentary approach of shoving their environmental message down our throats, this is the show for you. I don't think 10 minutes went by without something in regard to the environment being mentioned. <laughs> Oh, 
Not only was it annoying, but it also made these episodes utter bore fests to sit through. Each one is over 50 minutes long, and boy did they feel stretched out. Like in the first portion of the first episode, we have to listen to this scientist drone on and on about global warming. その中でもっとも早急な解決が求められているもんだというのが化石燃料を燃やすことによって化石燃料を燃やしますとその燃料の中にあった炭素窒素硫黄などが出てきましてそれが大気中にあります酸素と結合してこの酸素が ガイオから焼けて。Oh で、ご存知のように赤外線ってのは熱に関係した放射線です。ですから熱を捕まえて離さないって。We don't care. Clearly. I guess if I had to pick which episode was better than which, it would be the second episode for being slightly less boring. Plus, Dan actually showed up every now and then, so that was a bonus. Overall, unless you feel like you must watch the two Heisei Ultra 7 episodes from 1994, I recommend skipping these. I give them a generous one out of five grown-ups in spandex. Credit where credit is due, at least these two episodes weren't as bad as Ultra 7X. That's something. Right? I'll get around to the next batch of Heisei episodes at some point. Until next time, bye. Change, stop climate change, let's make it go away.